Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for me moving in front of the lectern. Thank you so much and welcome to this session where we're going to talk about oh, okay. debt and about climate and how to ensure okay. that governments, countries around the world are in the best possible position to raise funds to finance the transition to a green economy without compromising too severely their existing debt burden. Uh, and we're going to do that with a group of uh, experts uh, and really well-placed professionals to, to help us um, understand what's happening. And of course, this being talk, being described as, as the future talks, we're also going to uh, try to imagine solutions and what, is, what has worked best until now and what can be put in place to make it work even better. Now, government debt has been going up phenomenally um, in recent uh, times. In fact, recent data by the Institute of International Finances uh, is indicating that it's going to spiral to over 200 trillion by 2030. And a lot of this is going to be used by emerging markets to fund climate solutions. Emerging markets themselves are finding um, themselves in a really difficult spot because as of earlier this year, the debt to GDP ratio has gone up to 245%, which is an, an extremely high um, figure and a record figure um, as well. So to, uh, this is where we are now, but there are also a lot of uh, solutions and a lot of very bright <laughs> and clever people working to improve uh, the situation. So let me just call on stage two of such people who are going to take us through the work they've been doing uh, in this area. Uh, let me call them uh, on uh, stage, uh, and they're going to take us through, again, the presentation, very short presentation, 10 minutes, and then we're going to start our panel discussion. And then we're also going to get a couple of interventions from the floor. So let me call on stage Dr. Moritz Kramer, the chief economist of uh, LW, uh, LBBW, the bank, the German bank, and Dr. Vera Songwe, who is the founder and chairwoman of Liquidity and Sustainability Facility, which um, is helping, um, uh, is focusing particularly on emerging markets. We're going to, I'm going to use the first name uh, for all the panelists, if they don't mind, so welcome Moritz and Vera. Good morning, good morning everybody. Uh, we are a two tag team here. We're gonna start uh, the presentation and then uh, I'll, I'll give you the background. I think the presentation will come up. Um, as we start the presentation and as we're waiting for the slides to come on, there they are. Um, our remit is uh, we are the expert uh, review on debt, nature and climate, which is an independent comprehensive assessment of the relationship between sovereign debt, nature, conservation, and climate action in low- and middle-income countries. I think one of the things that is particular and special about what we are doing is really also the fact that we've added nature into the conversation, because a lot of the times when we have these conversations, we always talk uh, about climate, but we really are trying to bring the whole uh, picture uh, uh, together as we have this conversation. Um, we were launched uh, uh, by uh, a, a steering group of Colombia, Kenya, I'm going to go, um, the French, and of course the Germans, and we're very happy, one, to be here today at the Hamburg uh, Sustainability Conference because we believe this is a continuation of that conversation, but also the fact that uh, the German government has decided to launch the Hamburg Sustainability Conference shows that, and we hope really they're taking the conversation seriously. We know that the conversation on climate and green is under threat in many parts, but I think in the middle of that, having this conference is particularly important. Our timeline is essentially, we were launched in December 2023 uh, at COP. Um, we kicked off last year at the uh, World Bank uh, uh, spring meetings. We're just about to finalize, actually it's in print, the hot copy. Uh, wait with everybody, and we would launch and have the final copy of the report in October 20, uh, 2024 at the annual meetings in Washington, D.C., and the final report will be out in uh, uh, April of 2025, the spring meetings of the World Bank uh, annual meetings. 
Maurice and I are a co-chair uh, the report. Maurice, as you saw, is the chief economist of one of the bigger banks in Germany, so it's good to have him because a lot of the conversations around debt, climate, the transition, and growth in particular are going to come through how the banks finance and how the private sector finances that, that growth. So having, uh, uh, I think, Moritz here with us is, is particularly uh, useful and important as a co-chair. We're also working with ECLAC, uh, the Economic uh, Commission for uh, Latin America, the UN Economic Commission for Latin America, ODI, FDL, which is a French think tank, ODI is a UK think tank, and ASSET, which is an African think tank based in Ghana. So really, we want to be all inclusive. These are the members of the commission. I wouldn't go through all their names because we'll take our time. Uh, we've done an extensive uh, consultation around uh, uh, who should, be, who, you know, getting different views, as you know, the conversation around debt, climate, nature, really sometimes has competing views. One of them a lot has been this issue around, you know, if you do debt, then can you do development? If you do development, can you do growth? We are really about growth, actually. If you want to summarize what the commission is about, it's about releasing resources for growth. Uh, but to do that, we must look at climate, we must look at resilience, and we must look at nature. So that's really a big part of it. The first part of the work that we've done has been a lot of diagnostics. Many of the emerging market economies are facing a triple crisis of debt, nature, and, and climate. And for this, they cannot grow. So we need uh, to be able to unleash growth. The best way to reduce debt is to grow. How do you unleash that growth? Is to reduce the vicious circle of debt, climate, and nature, and see how we can reinforce uh, uh, growth in a virtuous way using climate, really. And there is an opportunity on the green development, but how can we use it? And the virtuous cycle of green and resilient economic growth is possible, and the, res the report will talk a lot more about that. And I will hand over now uh, to Moritz with one minute and 20 more, so you have a little bit more time, because you're going to start seeing some charts and different things, and hopefully uh, Morris can tell you about uh, what we are talking about in this uh, initial report. Well, thank you, Vera. I think I might pay you back this one minute that you donated to me now uh, at some, some other event. Mm, right. um, so we are uh, having this, uh, what we call like the triple crisis, climate, nature, and debt, uh, and they're reinforcing each other. Um, but much of the investment that is needed, not only to grow and develop, but also to react to the challenges um, of climate uh, change, of uh, degradation of nature and biodiversity loss. This requires funds which are not at the disposal of uh, low and lower middle income countries. And um, this is, uh, I, mean, they're, 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 I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but I was told I'm not allowed to, so I'll, I'll do this in a, in a very executive version. So we can clearly see that we are um, in a, we, we call it a debt crisis. Some people say it's a debt challenge, but it's, it's really like, like you know, it's, it's about words. We can see clearly here a time series um, of the classification um, from the fund, uh, how the countries are classified into whether they're in debt distress or the high risk of debt distress, and, and the trend is, is pretty clear that, uh, that uh, we have the majority of, of, uh, of uh, low-income countries are now at a high risk of their distress are already in there. It's obvious that there's not much funds available then to, uh, to address the challenges, which are not cyclical, but they're really structural and have uh, uh, related to climate change. It's not going to go up and down, it's just going to go one way, and you need to front load and prepare for this. Uh, and the same is true for nature. Once uh, you have degraded or reached tipping points, uh, there's no turning back. So uh, there is a vicious circle in many countries. I don't expect you to be able to read this. Um, uh, actually, I can't read it myself here, but I sort of remember. What, what, um, and, and the logic is, 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 is not very complicated. So we have uh, uh, an overhang of, of debt in many countries, which precludes investments in growth, in resilience against climate change and nature degradation, which in turn, um, reduces the growth potential and makes the debt um, situation worse. And this sort of just feeds on itself. So what we are um, in this expert group trying to do, which sounds uh, very complicated, and indeed it is, is to try how can we break this cycle and make it into a virtuous cycle, um, and more on that later. So as Vera pointed out, uh, the, f the interim report that we're about to launch is mostly about diagnostic. We explain how do these crises hang together where, where would be potential intervention points, but we're not really having a full um, portfolio of recommendations at this point. This will come at the final report later on, so it's more a diagnostic. Um, these are the issues and why. 
quantifying the challenges, quantifying the causalities. And uh, one exception to that is that we are actually one step further uh, with regards to debt sustainability framework. So there we have developed a number of, uh, of recommendations. Um, and the reason for that is that the discussion about reform on debt sustainability frameworks is ongoing and is already underway. So we want the expert's voice to be heard on that. Um, as, as many of you will know, the Fund and the World Bank are in, in, uh, in uh, intensive discussions on the way forward on that. So uh, I talk briefly about the conclusions on the debt sustainability frameworks. Um, the nutshell is really they do not, in their current state, sufficiently, um, or in some cases not at all, incorporate the complex relationships between debt sustainability, climate change, and nature, because they're traditionally calibrated to, uh, to measure cyclical shocks. You know, have a commodity shock, an interest rate shock, and you see, can you get over this? Um, so we propose three reforms to the DSF, and that's uh, where we will uh, spend a lot of time in Washington when we launch the report um, in two weeks' time. One is uh, just to create more transparency, to have actually a, a clear framework on um, what kind of warming scenarios do we use. Uh, we have to uh, incorporate the need for higher liquidity risks if you have a natural catastrophe hitting you. And we need to have also adaptation investment because the real challenge is if you say we need to include these new risks like nature uh, or climate change, most or many countries, I don't know whether most, it uh, remains to be seen, but many countries might actually be less credit worthy because you pile in additional risks. But that's only half the story. The other half of the story is if you allow for funding and investment into resilience, actually in the long term, they may be more credit worthy. And this is not reflected in the DSFs as they currently stand. Uh, we want uh, also uh, to encourage the fund and the bank to include nature risks, as uh, Vera pointed out, because they're entirely absent so far. You have uh, uh, tipping points um, which will impact the export, uh, public finances, the growth potential. These risks, these shocks uh, don't exist at all. Um, and then we need to have sort of more alternative scenarios also of funding um, uh, alternative accounting for, for climate investments potentially. You will have all of this in much more detail in the report which is about to, to come out and be on our, on our website which is called debtnatureclimate.org, I think. Exactly. So a very original name. Um, so what, uh, what will happen next um, after the launch of the interim report? Obviously much more interesting for many of you might be the final report with a full um, uh, suite of, of recommendations. Um, again, targeted for the spring meetings. Um, three main ad, uh, points here. One is how can we address the problem of unsustainable sovereign debt as it is? And of course, the debt sustainability framework is sort of one of the key building blocks, the foundations of that. Um, how can we um, generate additional resources for, uh, for addressing uh, climate and nature risks uh, without creating another debt crisis 10 years down the road? We cannot have the same conversation again and again and again. And finally, what kind of financial instruments could actually work towards that goal or uh, squaring the circle of debt sustainability uh, and climate and nature sustainability as well? So that's a small task we have here, um, but we have good people on the team um, and uh, we, are, we are very excited uh, about uh, this prospect and, and, and excited that you showed up in such large numbers and showed interest in this, in this subject. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's so interesting. Thank you so much for kicking us off um, with uh, these initial findings. And of course, I should also say that uh, Vera and Maurice are the co-chairs of the independent expert group, expert group on debt, climate and nature. Let me now invite uh, our um, other panelists uh, on stage. We have Annalise Dodds, who is the Minister for Development and the Minister for Women and Equities of the United Kingdom. Welcome, Annalise. We also have Rania Almashat, who is... Um, the Minister for Planning, Economic Development uh, and International Cooperation of Egypt. Welcome, Rania. Uh, and last but not least, we also have Ilan Goldfein, who is the President of the Inter-American Development Bank. Welcome, Ilan. <laughs> so let me start with you, um, Ilan. Um, we, um, we heard, we, we 
in from the presentation by Vera and, and Moritz, and very nice to see you. We, we met many, many um, years ago, if you remember, when I was covering your yeah. part of, of the world. And it's good to catch up again, and yes. this time talk about sustainable finance and climate. So um, the IMF, the World Bank, and multilateral banks, perhaps, can we say more broadly, that they haven't really quite got this right, have they? What would you say in terms of, <laughs> in terms of <laughs> how you can support and measure <laughs> the way in which you provide debt to countries that do need it to create a more sustainable future, including considering the effects of climate change? So a simple question to you, just, just the <laughs> opening for you, Elon. That's, that's what happened when we have relationship for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the right question. Uh, what, are, what are we doing as an MDBs? How do we solve this, this, this issue? It's a, it's, it's a very important issue. It's an issue about how do we address uh, climate finance, uh, our climate change going forward in a world where debt is per per pervasive. Mm. Of course, we can try with, and the, and, and, the, and the report says about it, you need to ha know how to calculate what is the cost. You need to know how to incorporate in the models, and I will let the authors basically deal with that. It's not easy. The models of the IMF, the models, how, how you can do it. But what I want to answer is actually the question that Sylvia is asking us is what, are, what can we do? So let me give you one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six ideas <laughs> of what are we doing. First, if you have debt, you better give debt in longer terms and longer maturities. This is an abstract. The IMF is doing it. They provide the RSF. And once they provide it, everybody wants it. We can do it. Like the MDBs also try to have better terms and conditions, number one. Number two, we can give better conditions on the lending. But it's good to give better conditions provided that the countries reach specific goals. Again, this is not abstract. It calls sustainability link bonds. Bonds link to goals. And now we, the MDBs, are incorporating in our loans the same, uh, the same methodology. In the IDB, it's called the bid clima, where you get a discount if you reach your targets. We offer this year for the countries. We just had an amount of resources to nine pilots. We all have them. Everybody wants it. Number three, debt swaps. Can you get better terms and conditions if you swap your debt from an old debt to a new debt based on guarantees that we can give the, the multilaterals? Or we can have the FC, which join us, and we will join together to have the largest debt swap ever in Ecuador. They had savings of one billion. Part of the savings for them, for that service, the other part for them and for us to preserve Galapagos. We are doing now guarantees to Barbados for resilience with the EIB. So that's number three. Number four, can we help countries with a specific debt when they are affected by a disaster to get better terms? Those are the C, climate resilient debt clauses, CDRCs, and we have them in our loans. Not enough, because we just give them some pause. We need to give them some insurance so that they actually don't have to pay, not only postpone. Number five, a lot of the investments are in hard currencies, in lower and middle income that have their own currencies. So we have a bundle. And here you have Annelise and the UK is helping us with Brazil to have a pilot where we can actually help countries smooth <coughs> currency moves. And we have a very large program with the World Bank, with Brazil, but there's a part which we can standardize, which is the part we give liquidity to countries when they face large depreciations, and that could be standardized to any country. And last but not least, because I want to give you back the the, the, the microphone is, we need to help these countries really when they get the debt 
to really use it in the best way possible. Because we, sometimes the worst is that you have large debt and you really don't invest in the right places. So thematic bond issuance, green, blue, social, we are now issuing, we're gonna issue Amazon bonds, but that's about use impact of what we get. So if you're gonna get the debt, at least invest the resources in the best way. Thank you very Th much. Thank you so much. So there, are, uh, th there is a growing suite of, um, of uh, instruments and solutions that development banks uh, are putting together. And I will want to come back to you about the speed at which this and the scale at which these products have been uh, offered. But uh, first, Rania, so uh, Ila, Ilan mentions uh, uh, debt swaps, so debt for climate swaps. And Egypt, of course, has experience in this, including uh, with, uh, with our host country, Germany. Uh, tell us, how are those solutions working? What would you like to see change? Well, thank you very much. Um, um, this is a very important topic, and uh, the more conferences we attend, it's coming center stage, and that's good. Because in the past, uh, the idea of indebtedness it was a little bit uh, you know, sensitive to talk about. Rating agencies would come in. If countries are, are looking into this in detail, uh, it does have repercussions. So it's very good that we are trying to put this center stage. It's great that we are linking it to sustainability. There's also um, uh, uh, a key element with respect to the DSAs, which we need to think about. And I'm just going to you know, mention this. We always say that we need to have concessional finance to move ahead with just transitions. If you take a look at the DSAs, they do not distinguish between concessional finance, commercial finance, or euro bonds, or any other type of debt. So it's very good, and I hope that the, uh, the report at the end tries to give some insight into how MDBs, when they are looking at the DSA itself, there's a, there's a, there's a single brush across all types of debt. And that, again, uh, if I'm going to go to the MDB and asking them all to work together to increase their concessionality, at the end of the day, it's debt on the country, and then it's going to show up in the DSA and it will have its repercussions. Mm -hmm. uh, on debt swaps, um, um, a very important aspect that we have uh, is that debt swaps are always a bilateral. The ones that work fast are the bilateral debt swaps because it's between a country and another country. Politics plays a role. Uh, but what is very key is that today countries have a uh, uh, more consistent vision on the importance of climate action, the NDCs, the energy transition. So it's coming more that the debtor country and the creditor country have a common denominator now, which uh, they can argue with their constituencies in, 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 the, in the creditor countries. And it's actually seen as a positive when we talk about public uh, goods global public goods. So this is, this, is, this is the importance of why debt swaps on a bilateral, uh, on, the, on the multilateral level, it's, it's there, but as you mentioned, the scale and the speed are not as fast as the, mm. uh, you know, the challenge at hand. What we have done over the past maybe 15 years, debt swaps with Italy and Germany in the uh, ball figure of $750 million, uh, all of them are directed uh, to uh, projects which are for conserving uh, uh, some of our uh, natural habitats. Uh, the most recent debt swaps we've done with Germany uh, is within our country platform, which looks at the energy transition. So for example, in moving from uh, power plants that use uh, gas into power plants uh, uh, or into, uh, into renewable energy, this has been a, a very important a cornerstone of our country platform, Nuafi. So that's, that's, that has been a very recent uh, debt swap, worked very successfully, and has been able to crowd in private investment. And this is, this is key. But um, maybe the, the conclusion of what I want to say, number one, DSAs do not distinguish between types of debt, and we need to, I don't know how to, I, I'm, a, I'm an IMF uh, economist by training, uh, so, so uh, and DSAs are very powerful tools where you put an equal benchmark against all countries. But given that, you know, today we are all suffering from uh, uh, nature issues, uh, uh, climate issues, how can we, we're pushing countries to take more concessional, we're take, telling MDBs, increase your pot of concessional finance, but then countries are not given a breather if they are able to access that type uh, of, of pool. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point is uh, in the calculation of GDP. There's a whole uh, uh, discussion now on how we can uh, include 
uh, some of the, and this is some of the points in the experts group, how can we include some of the adaptation spending and some of the nature in the GDP calculation itself, and that would help countries in their DSA. And then uh, finally on RSTs, uh, they are also linked to policies that governments need to do. So sometimes, even though they're concessional on long term, the, 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 the negotiation time of trying to come up is not as fast as uh, in many instances we would think that the tool is there, we're going to move ahead right away. It does require a lot of, a lot of preparation. I can go on on many other but, points, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Th thank you so much. So um, the uh, tools perhaps and the um, uh, details of how to make this work on a systemic level are still work in progress. But you said, Rania, quite rightly, that uh, when it comes to a bilateral agreement, things move faster. Now, um, if one of the two, uh, and arguably we can say that, of course, a, a climate uh, for that swap uh, is benefiting the whole world, but in, in reality, in the short term, um, it is also fair to say that one side of the equation is going to lose out uh, to the benefit of the other. Um, so, Annalise, when it comes to a country uh, like the UK, where we both work, which arguably has behind, been behind really the situation where we are now in terms of, in terms of cli climate change, but at the same time, you also need to please the, uh, and convince the electorate that it's worth spending money uh, in working on these solutions. How tough is the political message? How much are national politics going to play a role in tackling this global issue? And I think on that question, we need to be very clear that there's a shared interest in us all facing up to these challenges because, of course, we're seeing the impact of climate not just on countries which are fragile, conflict affected, least developed. We're seeing that impact, of course, on countries like my own as well. We need to be working together on this. And certainly for the new UK government, it's been very important for us to be clear that we have to work in partnership with other nations around this. It's got to be a genuine partnership and one that's based on mutual respect. And I think when it comes to the kinds of questions that we've been talking about, we've had very clear messages from a number of nations for quite a long time. You know, we've been very keen, for example, to listen to what countries like Grenada, Barbados have been saying. You know, the UK has followed that leadership, particularly around natural disaster clauses within debt agreements. You know, it's countries themselves that were saying this was needed so that they had that space to rebuild after a disaster. And I know we might get onto the topic of longer term climate resilience and preparedness later, but certainly when it comes to the initial hit of, for example, a hurricane, it's been very important for some countries to have that space. And the UK has really been trying to spearhead this, you know, delighted by the work that the IDB has been doing on this, of course, as well. And we, we saw that really coming into play with Hurricane Beryl. Uh, I think how important it was to have had those kinds of clauses. Um, we believe it's important for them to be mainstreamed. Uh, so we'll be really pushing for that as the UK. We think it's important that we have those kinds of clauses available in a way that isn't increasing the cost of borrowing uh, for countries uh, globally um, uh, and that are covering more disaster scenarios as part of a really transparent framework that enables countries to plan so there isn't a question about, well, has this been triggered or not, and that kind of confusion. Um, we do also think that disaster risk financing is important as well. And here, and you asked about public support, actually in a country like the UK, many people will have relations, friends, uh, members of their family close or more distant who are directly impacted by these disasters. We have now, I think it's about 18% of the UK population who are either born abroad or their parents were. They are hearing these stories directly. They want to know that countries like the UK are playing their part, working with others, working with multinational organisations. So we think there's a big role for leadership here. And actually, that leadership is supported by many of our populations. How, how much harder, if it has become harder, uh, are these kind of conversations within government, where there are so many other competing pressures? But that's space, always... struggling, cost of living. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that's always the question for government, isn't it? How you prioritise. Clearly, every country's circumstances will be different. You know, for the UK government, the current one, our fiscal inheritance is not as rosy as we would have liked it to be. 
but we will always focus on what will deliver the outcomes we want to see. We'll always seek innovation. And there again, a lot of that can be revealed through partnership because it's many countries themselves, you know, that have been pushing that forward as we just heard. Um, but also we'll make sure that, you know, for example, when it comes to our overseas development effort, that it is focused on that determination of combating poverty, working with others. So um, dare I say it, of course, these questions may have become more intense, but they've always been present for government. We've just got to be smarter, work harder and work closer together. All right, thank you. Let me also um, bring back in uh, Vera and, and Moritz. So we um, said that we also need to talk about the pace and scale of these solutions. And uh, if you, any of you were present at the opening uh, session yesterday, Mia Motley of Barbados, of course, made the point that, yes, we are heading in the right di direction, but the totals also can move in the right direction. It still may not get there. So how much can we push this little... Uh, uh, animal, if you want to, to stay with, the, uh, with this analogy, towards the end goal. Um, are you, how do you see the speed and, and, and pace and, and scale of this uh, development uh, moving? Vera. No, listen, um, thank you. I think uh, uh, Rania has said it uh, uh, very well, and uh, uh, President Elan has also spoken about the MDBs trying to come together and sort of share and work on a common platform. There is the MDB reform that is happening now and, and a lot of work that is going on there. Um, it's been a year, and our sense is that a lot more can be done. Uh, uh, clearly, there, there is a start, but even with a lot more that needs to be done, I think what Rania said is at the bilateral uh, uh, scale, it's going fast, but a lot of the countries have less about 30 to 40 percent of bilateral uh, uh, debt is uh, uh, of the debt today's bilateral debt. A lot of it is commercial debt, and debt uh, for nature swaps are considered defaults if you do them on the commercial basis. So mm. you can't really touch that yeah. in some sense. And so what we need is a lot bigger programs that can make sure one that there is additional resources given to the MDBs to begin. Uh, uh, to help those countries with guarantees to invest more, which will bring down their debt and allow them to have access to more capital. I think that's one of the sort of biggest injections that can get us to the scale that we need is additional resources into the MDBs. Mm. Of course, there's the special drawing rights, and we're advocating uh, for an uh, additional new issuance of special drawing rights uh, uh, that should go to MDBs uh, for climate that they can use to scale up and uh, the IDB has been leading a charge on, yeah. on some of this work in, in terms of asking for additional uh, uh, SDRs and, and the leverage factor of it, because it's really it's the scale of the problem. If you just look at what is happening in the United States, now they need $9 billion. They can, of course, write a check for $9 billion, but in Barbados, it's 40% of their GDP that gets wiped yeah. out with one event like that. And so what we need is to be able to respond very quickly and at scale. Mm. Otherwise, you know, what we know is that these events are going to be happening much more. They're going to be deeper, much more rapid, and countries do not have the time to wait yes. just to use the fiscal space that they have in existence. So, so my sense is we have some of the solutions. We know how to scale them. We need the resources to scale them, and that part is not happening fast enough. Thank you. Maurice, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think obviously the question of pace and scale, is that enough? Obviously not, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. um, so the... Um, the challenge really is that we always talk about debtor countries and creditor countries, but you mentioned the IIF numbers. Actually, the biggest debtor countries are the rich countries. Mm -hmm. No one has more debt than they have, um, and the the budgets are extremely tight. Uh, and um, you know these type of efforts, um, which seem to be in far flung places, very often take the back seat, and that's the challenge that, that you have to deal with as well um, in the UK as elsewhere. So we need to, 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 to find solutions that allow the, the necessary front-loading of these investments in, in times when both in the developing world as well as in the, in the advanced economies, budgets are extremely tight. And nothing suggests that it's going to get much better anytime soon. So we need to think out of the box and we need to think big. I, I totally welcome, and I'm actually, as a former IDB staff, it makes me very proud of what you do. Um, uh, but I think that goes in the right direction, but we really need to leverage this on a much larger scale. Because uh, we can talk about Barbados and Grenada, but in the overall scheme of things, yes. these are very small countries um, with small populations. They are so at the forefront of, of the challenge, sure, 
but we need to need to think much bigger. That's what we will be trying to do for, for the final report. SDRs play a role, but we also need to think about financing mechanisms that allow front-loading the funding through certain guarantee schemes. And we've seen things like blueprints um, in other areas, uh, if you think about uh, sort of finding financing of immunization or what the EU is doing, you know, try to, to, to front load the funding with long-term commitments of, uh, of rich countries, which currently just don't have mm -hmm. the money to cough it up. So we need yes. to make something out of nothing that's possible. Yes. So we have been talking about uh, public sector uh, funds, essentially, but clearly there is a big role for private sector. Uh, involvement and I'm just going to mention something very quickly which is um, a Bank of England recent survey that actually found that banks in the UK are for the first time actually um, losing a sense of how major climate change is mm. as a risk and I wonder what German banks actually looking again at you Moritz uh, are feeling and whether this is going to play a role in their readiness in jumping at the opportunity because we are you, you all are presenting this as an opportunity right for also the private sector to invest in, in those solutions. So that's another very interesting point, but perhaps something for a different panel. But Elon, let me, let me, get, back, um, let me get back to you. So uh, there is quite a lot of, again, work in trying to get more capital from your donor countries. But again, they're struggling, all of them, all around the world. How much of a, how realistic is it that you're going to get extra funding and how uh, realistic um, would it be that you could um, use those, those extra, that extra funding to also try and uh, attract private set investments by reducing their risk? So this is a session also about debt. And we have debt uh, and budgetary issues in the donor countries, and we have debt and fiscal issues in the receiving countries. Uh, and we have to realize that this is a major problem and it's not going to disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can try to do the best out of the resources we have. And when we talk about guarantees, we can try to do the guarantees and scale them, but guarantees sometimes have budgetary issues. And when the MDBs take the first loss, we, we say the risking, they said the, the private sector, it's very nice that we the risk, but somebody risks back. Mm -hmm. And when you risk back, you need capital, you need capital, you need shareholders. So let's think about how we're gonna solve this big problem in a scale and I think the only solution we really have is to be able to reallocate the private financing in the right direction. This is where the big money is, I think. Now, how are we going to do it? Well, some ideas are here. We can try to use our knowledge to generate the right investments, which is mm -hmm. we originate, but we don't stay with the law. We securitize, we share, and that's big bucks. Because we can originate, stay with 5%, sell them to the market mm -hmm. in a way that the market can buy it, and we can repeat it. If we do it together, not just the IDB, but the IDB, the all MDBs together, I think we have a place where we can do it. We can still use public sector, like the SDRs. SDRs is a way of our trying to reach public resources in a way that's not linked directly to the budget. Those are liquidity funds, mm -hmm. and I think we can use them. For every dollar that we get channeled to MDBs, we can do seven to eight. That's a gain scale. Now we have to convince, because it's not easy for central banks, and I'm a former governor, so I know exactly what I'm talking about, <laughs> to reallocate your SDRs, your liquidity, to MDBs. All right, so, so that will require, again, a, another conversation, but thank you for pointing, pointing us in, in that direction. I'd like to give a chance to Rania and Annelies also to share a few additional thoughts, and then we'll get the comments okay. from the floor. Uh, maybe um, any time there's a session on debt or a text globally on debt, it's the next uh, paragraph is about the international financial architecture. We saw, we saw it in the uh, Summit of the Future. Uh, there's a session right after this on international financial architecture. So the, uh, the idea that the SDRs are going to create that uh, headroom is extremely timely, important, and we need to push, uh, push forward. I have just two thoughts. Number one, uh, nature is very important in many countries, but also we have uh, adaptation issues in Africa, for example, these desertification. We have 
uh, many countries trying to move to renewable energy. So there's the energy transition as well. So I think that uh, this conversation needs to be a little bit widened. So it's not just nature and biodiversity, which are extremely important, but also uh, uh, different countries have uh, uh, different uh, um, needs. And, and, and this conversation has to widen to, to, include, uh, to include everyone. Uh, the second point is, yes, we want the private sector, but in a highly indebted country with high risk, private sector is going to you know, wait mm -hmm. until that risk comes down. So it's, it's again, a vicious yes. circle. That's why the, the de-risking from the MDBs is important. The grant components, the pockets of grants that are around uh, need to be obvious, clear, uh, and uh, need to happen in, in coordination in a, in a fashion uh, because the needs of the world are much, much mm -hmm. bigger than what's available. So we do have uh, a very tight spot everywhere but to keep on saying private sector is the solution, absolutely, but the private sector is waiting for indebtedness to be fixed yeah. to some extent. And also, uh, countries, uh, and we heard this yesterday, uh, uh, you have the creditors that need to uh, talk to their constituencies, but also the debtors need to talk to their constituency. Why am I not spending on education and mm -hmm. health and with the small fiscal space that I need when we know that the green transition is so important because I cannot get the FDI that it's needed to create the jobs and create yes. more revenue if I'm not doing that as well. So uh, the thing is um, uh, more on the SDRs, but faster decisions, yeah. please because, uh, again, indebtedness is much, much linked to the international financial architecture being uh, more or less solved, if I can use that word. Uh -huh. Thank you. Annelies, so very what's the UK's contribution? Yes. Yes, and I think the audience can't see the ticking time bombs that we have <laughs> in front of us. It shows I've got 25 seconds. I think that for the UK, this is about information, coherence, and leadership, because I don't want to lose the point about information that was mentioned previously around debt sustainability analyses. Yes, we do need to have a better understanding of the potential future impact of climate-related risk, but we also need to be factoring in that investment into mm -hmm. adaptation uh, and indeed mitigation where it facilitates further investment into our assessment of countries' economic potential. So that's incredibly important information. Number two, coherence. Coherence across institutions, across the MDBs, really pleased by some of the work that's going on at the moment around that, but also across countries too, the partnership that I was talking about before. And finally, leadership. I do agree with what was said, of course, as always, uh, uh, by Rania about the private sector, but the UK is really determined that we are doing what we can to show leadership in that space, to make sure that we're crowding in uh, the private sector where that's possible, really trying to leverage the power of the City of London around some of these questions with the challenges that we talked about. Um, so as I said, information coherence and leadership as well as the issues that were mentioned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, the gong, but, but uh, oh, we have oh, two. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going, I'm, I'm going to br b gently ignore the gong and ask for two, uh, for our two uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 attendees that are going to share um, a couple of uh, uh, comments to uh, do so. So first is Dr. Joel Clark, who uh, is the Minister for Sustainable Development, Environment and Climate Action and Constituency Empowerment of St. Kitts and Nevis. About a minute, if not. Thank you. Good morning. I really want to thank you for a very interesting and important conversation around um, debt sustainability. Um, the truth is adaptation finance for many SIDS. It's just about 0.2% of global climate finance. And that's a problematic. And that's one of the first things that we need to acknowledge. And the situation about debt, as was stated by our panelists, it's such that for small islands, I know you referenced Barbados, lost 42% of its GDP. With Hurricane Irma for Dominica, it was 102% mm. of its GDP. Mm. And in Barbuda, the island disappeared completely. So there's no plausible way for governments to respond to their existing debt and then respond to um, disaster-related debt. It's unsustainable and it means we're going to be in cycles of debt. And we know every year there's a hurricane that we have to face. So that's the problem that we have to respond to. Additionally, that's why small islands like the Caribbean, we support completely the Bridgestone Initiative and the need for the pause when we're dealing with, when we're responding to debt. So what needs to happen is that debt, um, the climate proof debt solutions and climate finance has to be fit for purpose for small island developing states. 
we have to reframe how we think about the burden of debt for SIDS and appreciate that small islands like St. Kitts and Nevis, where I'm from, we just don't qualify for overseas development aid. We don't qualify for a lot of concessional financing. And that's why we need the MDVI, multidimensional um, vulnerability index. We need a more comprehensive and realistic look at what debt means to us. And finally, in terms of scale, I know we all speak about scaling up solutions, making them more um, um, accessible for small islands, but sometimes we need to have serious conversations about the smallest scale um, solutions for financing, S um, solutions that are diverse and response to the context for small island development states because it's not one size fits all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Um, and the final comment by uh, Mandy O'Brien, who is the director for Public Partnerships Division at UNICEF. Um, and maybe we can get, yeah, thank you so much. We get the microphone to you. Thank you for this insightful uh, panel. Maybe just uh, to put squarely children out there because children are disproportionately bearing the brunt of <coughs> both climate change, but also the increasing uh, financial burden of debt. And as we speak, actually, we know one billion children on this planet are at extremely high risk of being impacted by uh, climate uh, uh, change. And in the same breath, we are talking about 300 million children in extreme poverty. And we also know the reality that most of the low-income countries are using 15 to 20 percent of their domestic rev revenue to service debts. And this means that they are cutting back on critical social sector investments as Minister Rania said, be it education, health. And just to conclude this first point, to say that uh, imagine what happens when conflict comes on top of debt and climate change and everything else. In Sudan, where I most recently served for the last three years, we were already grappling with conflict change, debt, and so much else, and then with the war, what we've seen is that the investment in education has gone below a dismal 1%, mm. and health is below 4%. So, so that takes me to my second and final point, which is on practical solutions. So we as UNICEF, we are looking at debt swaps uh, for climate and social services for children, and we are working with bilateral partners in this regard. How do we unlock grant financing for, for child critical infrastructure to make those more climate resilient. And then B is how do we turn debt related liabilities into prioritizing social sector spending mm -hmm. for children. So maybe just to the panel as we look at Baku and COP29, yes. what is it that we will bring to the table from these discussions? And a child lens would be really critical. Thank you, and it's um, so uh, up to end with uh, a mention um, uh, of children, given that, of course, uh, the nature of the problem you all trying to tackle, we all trying to tackle, um, has to do with the very existence uh, of humanity. And I'm not even being over dramatic. And of course, this being the stage that looks at uh, future talks, um, it's uh, a perfect ending to a very interesting discussion. So I'd like to thank my panelists for sharing their thoughts and their time and for you to, to being here listening to us and of course here um, at the Banker, which is a publication part of the Financial Times Group, we will continue to monitor um, all matters related to the global finance, financing system and uh, also sustainable finance. So I hope you will all uh, keep in touch with us and join me in welcoming and in thanking again our wonderful panelists. Thank you.